So to today's uh, first um, uh, panel, uh, I love the name and I'm ready to get into it. So uh, don't talk to me about gender, we have a disaster on our hands. Uh, and that we saw this play out at our recent, recent uh, Hazelwood event, um, very much saw this in our own organisation. So I'm really looking forward to hearing from the panel. Uh, the Gender and Disaster Task Force, its background and future. So would you welcome uh, Susie Reid, Helen Riseborough, uh, Frank Archer, Daryl Taylor and Steve O'Malley. Thank you all very much for being here today. Uh, how many of you have got sore necks after last night with Wimbledon and then with the soccer as well? So, uh, uh, Aussie, 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 and let's have a good day here talking about gender and disaster. Uh, I just wanted, hold on, we'll get organised. Uh, the point of my presentation today is just to give you some background about the research that Women's Health Goulburn North East have done. We are a women's health organisation. We're based in uh, Wangaratta, but we cover a fifth of the state of Victoria from Corriong through uh, Wodonga, over to Shep, New Merca, um, down to Wallen, my favourite place, Beveridge, and King Lake. So we've got a uh, very large area that uh, we cover. And after the uh, Black Saturday uh, bushfires, uh, we felt that there had been a, a gap in the research around disaster and family violence. So our two researchers, Deb Parkinson at Women's Health Goulburn North East, who we share with our colleagues at Wynn, and the wonderful Claire Zara, who's here today. Deb's actually in uh, Japan. Claire and Deb are going to Japan next week to talk about gender and disaster to a big conference over there. So we're very lucky to um, have Claire here today, who was one of the main researchers in the qualitative research that we did with women after the Black Saturday uh, bushfires. And so what Claire and Deb did was they interviewed uh, 30 women and 47 uh, workers and we desperately wanted to hear the voice of the women and their experience after Black Saturday. We also, or they also, that's the royal we, did a very comprehensive international literature uh, review, which provided us with the evidence um, that there was increased family violence after disaster. And so we knew that something had to be done about this, and that's where our groundbreaking research uh, started. So in, uh, we did that 2009 to 2012. Then in, see if I can get this um, right, in 2012, we joined with our colleagues at Women's Health in the North and we convened the first Australian conference on natural disaster and family violence. This was really well supported by the ESOs, uh, the government, community workers and key academics in the field of gender and disaster. And I'd like to quote um, Tim Cartwright, who opened the conference, and read you his words. This is about men being men as they see themselves, as we see ourselves in response to disaster. The implications are that in the public, we are strong and fearless and not affected. But the implication for many women is when we get home, we don't cope at all. The women, as invariably the closest to these people, suffer. We see increased family violence. We see kids exposed to increased family violence. We see increases in alcohol consumption, in drug consumption, breakdowns of all sorts, and the reduction in employment. There is much to be seen, much to be learned from the research, even as small as it is. There is much more we can do to explore this environment. And we continue that journey today. And you'll hear about it with our panel discussion. So what happened was that DHS contracted Women's Health to develop a training package on national disaster and family violence to train workers in recognising 
responding to poster to post disaster violence uh, and this is now available on our website. DHS altered from that work the design of its quarterly reporting to include the reporting of family violence. It hadn't been there before. Vic Police decided to deliver training to new recruits, now using our resources to train repeat, repeat to train police recruits in risk management post-disaster. We produced resources. Here's some of the cards and the training packages that we have produced. We developed postcards offering a simple guide for people who want to help women experiencing family violence after disaster. We always like the KISS principle and uh, we keep it as simple as possible. We provide, um, a, we developed a series of four snapshots which present the key findings and recommendations from our research. We provide overview of the key issues identified by women post-disaster with a series of tangible strategies. So what can we do for keeping women and children safe post-disaster? These have been widely distributed to service providers and are available for download from our web website. So it's the Women's Health Goulburn Northeast website. So these are the, not going, not going. What's happening there? Oh, back. Holy dolly, isn't modern technology wonderful? So here are some of the snapshots. This is what you'll get. All the information in one quick read uh, there. And then we produced our resources. These are the sort of postcards that uh, we have. Sorry, back one. The postcards, uh, there's the snapshots. And we produce these postcards. And on the back, there are some simple suggestions <laughs> of what you can do. So. After that, what happened? Well, we were funded by the, Nat the National Disaster Resilience Grant Scheme to work with women's, um, to work with the um, Monash In Injury Research Institute to undertake some more qualitative research in 2013 with 32 men affected by the Black Saturday bushfires. Because the women kept saying to us, but what about the men? And our organisation is into prevention and therefore you begin back. And that was with finding out the issues uh, with men. We were um, motivated by the need to increase the safety of women and children after disasters and reduce men's harmful behaviours both to themselves and to their families around them. Uh, we found out that post Black Saturday Debriefing was of, um, quite often very <coughs> inadequate. Some men were pen penalised for seeking psychological help. Gender norms were more salient and often harmful. Alcohol abuse, mental health issues and suicide issues all arose. Violence against women increases as well as instances of bullying and aggressive interaction among the men. So that was our men on Black Saturday, risks and opportunities for change. So we launched our research, which was Just Ask, and at a conference called Just Ask, a conference on the experiences of men after um, disaster. Again, this was fantastically well received. Uh, we brought together representatives from the emergency management sector, again, government and other key organisations, to inform responses to men in future disaster and minimise the adverse consequences of men, women and children. Uh, this was an extremely um, emotional day for those of you that were at it. We had one of the marvellous, one marvellous man, Andrew, who uh, spoke at this conference about his experience, and we had one of the women who had been in the um, earlier research talking, talking about the effects 
on her and the relationship and her partner. So that was another very, ex um, sorry, very, very um, special day. We had some very uh, good people sitting on the panel, which we've, some of them are here today as well, and it was sponsored uh, by a lot of these people here who are now part of the task force. So just to finish, that Women's Health One, uh, our Women's Health Organisation in 2013, won the Vic Health Promotion Award for advancing knowledge and understanding in the area of gender and disaster. The formalisation of this um, GAD, as we call it, task force, auspiced by, as we heard, um, the Victorian Fire Services Commissioner, and with representation from key emergency service organisations, academia, government department, women's health um, services. So this was um, our group getting together and it was one of those very lucky days. We went out into the hallway and asked for someone to help us take this photo and we seemed to have got a professional photographer on the day and he was standing on chairs and getting us all to smile and get closer together. But anyway, it's fantastic to see the Disaster Task Force. Our next meeting is on August the 12th and we have um, Elizabeth Broderick coming down to speak to us with the head of uh, the army. So things are, are really moving forward. We like to do the KISS principle, but we don't by any means of the imagination avoid uh, the hard things that have to be um, discussed. And there are a lot of them, and it's uncomfortable at times, as it always is when you talk gender, disaster, and family violence. Thank you very much. Thank you, Susie. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name's Helen Riseborough, and I'm the CEO of Women's Health in the North, a um, northern metropolitan Melbourne-based women's health service. So along with our colleagues at Women's Health Goulburn North East, we cover, on geographic terms, about a third of the state. So a lot of the projects and work that we conduct together is very exciting because we not only cover a huge geographic spread in Victoria together, but um, a lot of the work that we're doing, of course, overlaps and there's some terrific outcomes when you're able to look at the effects of um, a whole range of health issues, um, particularly impacting on women and children, um, when you're looking at, um, you know, yeah, that, that geographic spread, but also the fact that we're covering rural um, and a metro region and, of course, everything in between, the, the peri-urban areas which, um, and peri-rural areas which is sort of so needy, and including the growth corridors in the northern uh, region. So Susie has mentioned... Oh, I better get my little ticker going. There we go. Um, ..has mentioned um, that from the research projects what's really clearly come through is a need um, uh, for the acknowledgement that women's experiences and voices need to be better incorporated into disaster planning, management and recovery and in rebuilding in communities after disaster. Incorporating a gender analysis and awareness of increased family violence after disaster is crucial for the health, safety and well-being of women and children, and of course it's imperative for the health of men and of the whole community or communities. Women's Health Goulburn North East and Women's Health in the North, as I said, cover about a third of the state in terms of geographic reach. And we believe that our organisations have pioneered work in the area of what we are referring to as environmental justice. The work that we've been undertaking, including the research that Susie mentioned, um, is available and on the websites, as she said. Um, this slide represents um, one of the postcards, and I've popped a few of them on your table, so just use that as a bit of a, um, a link, if you'd like to, to the work on our websites. The range of resources, including the liter a literature review on women and environmental justice, um, are on the website as well. Um, there are links to, uh, there will soon be a link to a chapter 
on women and children in a book to be published by the CSIRO that um, some of our uh, staff have been working on entitled Climate Change Adaptation by Community-Based Health and Social Service Organisations. Um, and there's also a link to a new, um, new document um, published by the Australian Women's Health Network, um, a position paper that I've just put a link to there. The paper, which was undertaken by Arwen, this um, uh, national women's health organisation, contracted Women's Health Goulburn North East and Women's Health in the North um, to actually pull together this document, which is about the health impacts on women of climatic and economic disaster. So it's an incredibly comprehensive account of um, literature, but also what the issues are. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's a really good read. Um, the paper points to issues like um, financial consequences, housing, increase in domestic violence, mobility issues, barriers to income production, and the lack of women's involvement in the decision-making, planning, and policy-making processes um, uh, in to, you know, ensuring that, that, community, um, that communities are included and that the, f the whole community is included in that process. Um, the paper makes a series of recommendations as well, including the establishment of the um, Emergency Management Gender and Disaster Task Force um, in Victoria and, of course, suggests that all states and territories in Australia follow Victoria's lead in that. The, um, there are two uh, women's health alliances, well, there's a few at a national level in Australia, two of which um, joined forces last week to um, undertake a roundtable discussion about the economic impact on women of disaster-affected areas in Australia. And I've just put up a, a little um, snippet from it to, um, to let you know that two, these two organisations, a, a group called Economic Security for Women and the National Rural Coalition, um, both of which are Commonwealth-funded initiatives and alliances, um, set up this roundtable last week with Michaela Cash um, attending the first part of it. Um, I attended the roundtable meeting as a representative of Women's Health in the North and Women's Health Goulburn North East. Um, my key messages were about the Gender and Disaster Task Force in Victoria. I thought that was really important for others to know about at a Commonwealth level and people were really excited and um, very impressed by that work and that initiative here in Victoria and also the importance of recognising that violence against women increases after disaster. That was something that I think needed to be added to the, to the roundtable discussion. Um, and of course the key role of women's services, um, not just women's health services but all the women's services across Australia in um, this disaster work, um, including the rebuilding of communities. The discussion at the roundtable focused on answering the question, how is the economic impact on women accommodated in current approaches to disaster preparation, emergency management, disaster relief, recovery and mitigation policy and financial assistance? That's a pretty big question. And to add to that, how can a gendered approach make a difference? So they were the two topics, if you like, for this roundtable. And the discussion was very far-reaching and robust with a myriad of suggestions being made for work at the Commonwealth, state and local government levels um, for governments but also for community service organisations and health organisations, for academia, for local communities in general. My own suggestions um, included gender sensitivity and analysis in emergency management Acknowledging women's roles in their communities. Acknowledging that violence against women increases after disaster. And that violence against women is rarely spoken about, it's not asked about, and it's not acted upon necessarily in, in, in a good way. And also the acknowledgement of the pressures on men after disaster. Um, Victoria's Gender and Disaster Task Force, as I said, was heralded as... Um, particularly by those of us from Victoria, of course, as a model for other states and territories to follow. Susie mentioned that our colleagues, um, Deb Parkinson and Claire Zara, who are here, who's here today, um, are going to be attending the um, 
World Congress of Sociology in Japan next week. Um, and they've been invited to make a presentation with Elaine Ennison, who's the, an eminent researcher and scholar in gender and disaster. Um, so it's very exciting. Um, we're entering the international stage, I suppose. Um, so I think we are being seen as experts here in Victoria um, and can be proud of the work being done here um, and the leadership being shown by women and men in this state. So just to conclude, I think women's health services are well placed to guide the Gender and Disaster Task Force. Our work involves developing resources um, such as research, obviously, building an evidence base, and Susie spoke quite a bit about that before. Um, analysis tools and planning tools we've developed as well. Training in a whole range of areas, and I've just listed a few areas here, um, and that, that can be used by emergency service organisations. And I hope the task force will draw on the resources and the input from the women's health services in the coming months. Um, what we need, I think, is a, a really sustained and systematic um, change, and it probably starts with organisational change, doesn't it? Um, not just a series of one-off projects and poorly funded bits and pieces, um, but something that's, that's integrated and sustainable. So um, we are very excited about the work of the task force and would like to thank those who've been really instrumental in getting it going. And um, I'm very excited about this gender stream today at this conference um, and thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to speak to you. And I hope it will be a, good, a really great day. Thanks. Morning. Um, it's just a delight to join this workshop and secondly uh, this panel and I just want to build on a little bit of uh, the work that Susie outlined for you and just talk about one or two of the issues within the uh, research environment within which this project was uh, conducted. But before we start, a bit of audience participation. Just uh, head for the roof with your hand if you've read both the reports that Susie outlined. That's encouraging, almost half, so that's good. So the message, of course, is that those who haven't uh, might like to go and do that. So that's, uh, that's great. So firstly, I want to just speak about uh, and acknowledge those two studies. They've been outlined in detail by Susie. Um, the first primarily looked at uh, the impact on women. The second came from the first when people said, but what about the men? And therefore the second study evolved. And I would ask you to make a mental note, to make a handwritten note on your notes there, that when you get home or very soon, if you haven't looked at those two reports, to go and have a look at those two reports. But in doing so, don't just open up the abstract and just don't go to the conclusion but have a look at two elements of it. Have a look at the content, but most importantly, have a look at the process. What steps did this research team go through? Because it's the process that has become a very important part of this exercise. So if we have a look firstly at the, <coughs> excuse me, at the first study. The report of the first study clearly articulates some of the cautions some of the concerns, some of the difficulties and some downright opposition to the evolution of the first study. It was not funded by an external body, it was internally funded, it was stimulated from an observation within the group. But what the process, what reading about the report and looking at the process, you get a very clear picture of the expertise, the willingness to consult, the willingness to uh, to be inclusive from the research team based at Women's Health Global North East, to overcome, to listen to, to look for solutions and to overcome uh, these barriers. So now, <coughs> three, four years later, Susie was here before proudly announcing and this workshop is about and stimulated by uh, Steve, uh, the, <coughs> the, the Gender in, in uh, Disaster Task Force. 
it <coughs> combines not just all of the ESOs but also community members and organisations and, um, and some uh, academic input as well. And so this is a very positive outcome which has taken time. And so again, it's this process that I would encourage you to not be frustrated by momentary barriers or perceptions of obstruction when there is an issue to explore, to explore it thoroughly, properly, talk, become inclusive and uh, you might build an outcome like this. So what was the outcome? It's not just the task force. Uh, the task force is a mechanism to some degree. The real outcome was that <coughs> as the study moved from the first into the second, but particularly the first, identified an incidence of domestic violence. This is well known in the international literature uh, associated with disasters and emergencies, but it's hidden and silent in the Australian context. So the really significant issue of this first report was that it gave voice to this hidden issue of significance. And so what I'd encourage you to do is to engage with that voice, to engage with the challenge, to explore, to look at some of the barriers, to look at potential solutions to move positively towards improvement on a broad front and not being locked in any particular issue. The second study then moved forth and this one was externally funded. So that's a, an acknowledgement of the quality of the, uh, the first uh, study, but the second study was externally funded. And very soon after it started, another potential barrier uh, was uh, encountered, when it was, in, it was encountered rather, and that's uh, the nature of ethics. And ethics and ethics committees are often seen by academics and researchers as barriers and the dark side. But in this instance, the first ethics committee, when they reviewed the, uh, the proposal, identified quite correctly a number of concerns with respect to the nature of the research. The environment in which it was being conducted, the topics and the themes to be investigated, and most importantly, potential dangers to the researchers. And so they asked for a larger ethics committee with more experience in this sort of work if uh, the researchers would consult one of the larger groups, which they did. And the researchers then met with the chair of this larger uh, ethics committee and with the executive officer, put in their proposal to that stage and there was an instantaneous response from the chair of the ethics committee of this large organisation and the executive officer which said, this is important research. This needs to be done. We must protect both the researchers and the participants. We must consider these issues as you further develop your proposal. And this is how you might go about it. And so the researchers took that advice and it was ultimately very quickly at the first meeting approved. And so I think this is a very positive experience of an ethics committee which has helped shape and make safe the, uh, the process because the outcome therefore becomes important. And the third point that I'd like to make is to acknowledge the professionalism, the care, the compassion, the expertise and the inclusiveness of the research team. Firstly, those involved in recruiting who were not the research officers but were the admin staff of uh, Women's Health Gulf and North East. And then secondly, Claire, you've heard referred to and Deb as the researchers. They are enormously respected for their qualitative approach, for their compare care and compassion and their support. And on that basis, because of their professionalism, because of the process that they've worked through, I think we can look with confidence at the outcomes and the outcomes have indeed been looked at by many people. They've made judgments about the quality and that's been another factor which led to the ongoing formation of the task force. My fourth and second last point is that, as Susie mentioned, a number of issues have come up. 
uh, in both of these studies, uh, ranging from issues relating, for example, to debriefing, uh, relating to gender roles and gender support. These have largely been tabulated now, have been taken on by the task force. The task force is in the process of putting together a strategy and an action plan, which you'll hear about, uh, and I'm sure that this will lead it to, uh, to great outcomes. Now, yesterday was a very important day in this state. It was the birth of EMV. And uh, you uh, no doubt uh, had a uh, presentation. I wasn't here yesterday, unfortunately. Uh, but I think later today, the, uh, the midwife of the MV, uh, Commissioner Lapsley, will speak. Um, and we also need to understand that this is in the setting of change at a national level. And the National Strategy for Disaster Resilience uh, was released by the federal government back in 2011, not that long ago. And within that were two, for this purpose anyway, two very important elements that we need to reflect on. The first was the concept of shared responsibility, that everybody has a role in the setting of disasters and emergencies. And the second, and consequent to that, was the need to delegate functions and to empower the community. And so I'd ask you to keep this in mind, that this issue is of managing and responding and preventing and uh, recovering from uh, disasters and emergencies is not just about ESOs, but it's just also about the breadth of the community. Now, there's a very important trend going on out there in the community. If you step outside the ESOs for a moment and have a look at the community, then there is an increasing number of leaders at the community level in the setting of disasters and emergencies who are women. A very, very strong, capable leadership cohort. And we need to build that element into this exercise as well. And I'd like to bring to your attention the Boyer series of lectures last November. This is an annual ABC event. And last year they had uh, at the stage, uh, she was our Governor General and now Dame uh, Quentin Broyce. Um, and she spoke uh, over four lectures um, about some of her journey uh, throughout uh, her life from a country girl in Queensland through to uh, her role as our Governor-General. And she spoke about neighbourhoodness and connectedness. She spoke about watching the women. She spoke about Australians at their best and looking to the future. And I would commend this to you to have a look at. It's available online. You can get it at ABC bookshops. But it's also available to download online to, um, to be inspired by in terms of this change that's going on. So in conclusion, I'd like to just pick up on the point that Susie said before, that this is not just a matter of, of looking at the work environment within ESOs. It's also a matter of reviewing stereotypes and changing attitudes and looking for improved outcomes and impacts for both men and women and other groups within the community as well. But I'd ask you to think beyond the ESOs, to think also about the community level activities within the community and the setting of emergencies and disasters and also the community ESO interface. All right, well, thank you. It's been an absolute joy to be part of the task force looking at gender and disaster. Um, I want to... It's a really, really good project and it reflects an area of interest for me, which is how do we translate these experiences of behavioural violence in communities and also in relationships between communities and other organisations, community groups, etc. How do we translate that into change? And for me, a lot of that is around cultural and structural change. So I've got, a, I've got essentially got four PowerPoint slides pulled into one up there. And it just, it's my map that's helped me as a community member move through the disaster or emergency management process. So from preparedness through response, through recovery and, you know, to some kind of regeneration um, in community and, and also personally. So um, I was affected by the Black Saturday bushfires and I saw the personal uh, impact. You know, we had major conflict at home um, in, on Black Saturday and, and it's very consistent with the kind of research that Christine's going to be presenting about later in, in the day. And it was just at that level of 
do we stay or do we go? The planning that we kind of had done previously was out the window. There was a lack of certainty with regard to being, being warned. We were in this uncertain space that we hadn't planned for and it caused conflict. And that conflict continues to impact our relationship today. You know, it's been one of those things that's uh, sat with us, that degree to which we trust each other, whose judgment prevails, those kind of questions. Um, we've also seen, I've also seen that kind of conflict also in community groups and in relationships within communities. So at one level, I think disasters sometimes send communities back, um, you know, an incredible amount of progressive work from pro-feminist men and women to, you know, move towards a more equal society, more equal relationships. And disasters tend to throw you back into times where you get... Uh, you know, very much that model, the kind of thing that comes from the top left-hand corner on the diagram up there, that centralisation, that power over, that command and control. All of a sudden, local knowledge and trust gets disowned. So all of the really hard work that's been done to build community, to build respect, to build trust, some of that goes out of the window. And we found there was enormous conflict just within our community groups. So, you know, there was jockeying for positions of power, there was... Uh, lots of conflict around who was going to own a particular project or not, et cetera, et cetera. And that was in the context of also having to work together to try to negotiate with local government, with community service organisations, with state government, um, and also with emergency services organisations. So I'm really interested in how the contexts that people within which people dwell affects what they do. And I think these four domains are kind of what we've got to work within the aftermath of disaster. It's the, the state government, you know, the kind of... the way Department of Justice kind of stepped in over the top of CFA in particular after the fire and had, you know, very much top-down control over messages that were going out, who was able to speak, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. This kind of uh, culture spills over into communities as well and has an impact on the relationships that happen in places that are impacted by disasters. I'm really interested in the way Department of Human Services contracts service providers. So it's really specifically prescribed what service providers do. And that also impacts on the context within which behaviours take place in disaster-impacted communities because the, the range of resources and the range of responses that community service organisations can provide are circumscribed by the contracts that they receive from state government. So the directives, again, that they receive top-down, they're kind of co-opted into the state's leadership role, if that makes sense. I'm really interested in, in community and also its limitations. So as a community member in the aftermath of the disaster, I've never participated in anything like the kind of amazing processes that happened in particular in the first three months after the disaster as, as there was this vacuum, this void, this space into which people stepped in and stepped up. So the profound collaboration in the aftermath of disasters among community members, men and women self-organising to work together was extraordinary. But also then you get the descent of the matrix, you get all of the different organisations and structures and agendas start to impact on on your community and all of a sudden all the good work that's been developed is incredibly compromised. And I think what the bottom right hand corner is, what I would suggest our opportunity is, is how do we actually shift away from just that, the limitations associated with community, the limitations associated with centralisation, the limitations associated with co-optation. How do we actually literally get to collaboration? And for organisations like emergency services organisations, I think that presents some significant challenges because historically the top-down command and control response-oriented organisations have been very task-oriented, very directive. People have had to be you know, compliant and obey. And so to work in collaboration is to work in open networks, in open webs, in ecologies of relationships and to be incredibly responsive and flexible. So... There are some of the challenges that I think it prevent, presents emergency services organisations, but there are also some of that opportunities. How do you take some of the principles of interoperability and take them outside the emergency services organisations into their relationships with other organisations and also out into the community? So it is uh, an open process rather than a closed process. So all of the different strengths of the different sectors can be brought together. It requires a lot of facilitation it requires a lot of an enablement and it requires essentially a transformation. It's that institutional and cultural change that can also support and enable behaviour change.